All right, you ready for this? Yeah. Look what I did. Ooh. Oh, her hair is beautiful. How fun. She's a beauty. Great. Good? Good. Yep. Accommodated your LA diet. I'm still on an anti-inflammatory diet. But she's drinking today. But I'm going to have some tequila because it's been a week Cheers. since I had an alcoholic beverage. So it'll be a cheat day. It's the only kind of date I want to be. All right. You know, I haven't had tequila in weeks either. Really? I've been drinking just uh, vodka and whiskeys. I only drink tequila with you. Because I bring out the most fun in you. That's why. Good boy. What is this? Oh, wait. Why are you already looking at it? Secrets. Okay, well, she already looked at it. Damn it. <laughs> Let's do her intro and then I'll explain what this is. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. This is Two Girls, One Crime. Not Cup. And my name is Vita. I'm Jackie. And uh, if you haven't already, subscribe below and like this video. If you haven't uh, checked out, we have a Patreon. We have giveaways. We have exclusive footage. I've been cutting out some really, really funny conversations. Really funny conversations that had nothing to do with the podcast <laughs> is in our Patreon. So and outtakes. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. Because we're amazing. And if you haven't found us on Instagram or Twitter, we are very active, meaning she because she is in charge of those accounts. Also share it with your friends or your grandma. I always say grandma. <laughs> and apparently our grandmas are really into true crime. Our great grandmothers. That plays into what this is right here. All right, what do you got, what do you got? Okay, so my mother just visited, which is irrelevant to the timeline of this story, but she was like, hey, I, I brought something for you from Chicago. She was going through her mother's old boxes and she said, look at what I found. Just a reminder, my name Vita, I'm named after my great grandmother Vita. Mm. So what does this say on the front of it? Vita Tower? And then what's the subject? Murder. So I was like, what? My great grandmother, if you can see, my great grandmother was into murders? Look at that mean. Uh, 1927. This is from 1927. Isn't that crazy? Oh my, God. my mother fucking ripped it right there. It was in mint condition until my mom Wait. fat fingered it. No, hold on. This is actually like really, really freaking. Oh, I just ripped it. What is wrong with everyone? This paper is so fragile. And then oh. there's articles from this time of murder, like of true crime. This is actually kind of disturbing, I'm not going to lie. But isn't this crazy? Like, my great-grandmother was into true crime and but wait, I'm into why? true crime. Was your grandmother, like, a serial killer? No, this was her class. How dare you? Because this is crime. Do you think people think we're serial she killers? She studied murder. I don't know, but I do think that people who do true crime are a little weird. Well, I'm never going to get rid of this. All right, Jackie. Yeah. So, so, what kind of case did you choose for us today? Today's episode was actually a recommendation by a fan. Oh. We have fan. We'll start incorporating this. He's actually a friend that I know from high school. Jeremy G. He uh, shot us a DM and was like, "Hey, do y'all know about this case?" And I was like, "No, I don't." So I looked into it. It was pretty interesting. The teen vampire of Krakow. Oh my god, another vampire I know. story. It's another gruesome one. <laughs> Look at my napkin and look at yours. <laughs> I'm a mess. <laughs> um, where is your lampy top? Miss Movie Star. Oh yeah, I was in a movie. Which should be available online by the time this episode comes out. It's got Morgan Freeman in it, and Juliette Binoche, and Frank Grillo, and Cameron Monaghan, and me. What is it called? Paradise Highway. Yeah, what's it about? Human trafficking in the trucking industry. <laughs> she liked it because she's a trucker. I have worked in the trucking industry. Okay. Carol Cott. The teen vampire of Krakow. Is it Krakow or Krakow? I don't know. Where is Krakow? Poland? 
Oh. Poland. The teen vampire of Krakow. All right. He's creepy looking. Carol Cott was a Polish murderer who terrorized the city of Krakow from 1964 to 1966. His victims were at random and included children and the elderly. You know, I just want to say, in the 60s, there was less uh, communication. Mm. You know, like, we have the internet now. It feels safer. Mm. Safer? Yeah, because you can, like, be like, hey, I'm in trouble. You can, like, literally Mm. send an SOS. You don't have to do Morse code. Yeah, that's true. You have the cell phone. You can call. It's so pretty. You can tweet. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's so many ways to alert someone that you're not safe. In the 60s, it was like... Well, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, yeah. You're if you out. can't run away or get away, then you're fighting to the death. I mean, that's still the case now. Mm-hmm. But at least there's, you know, that that one thing that you have now. Carol Cott was born on December eighteenth, nineteen forty-six. I believe that makes him a Sagittarius or a Capricorn. Do we know? Mm-mm. Making him only eighteen when we be- when he began his murder spree. He was born in Krakow. Wait, how do you say Krakow? 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 Should we, should we look this up before we get too far? Yeah. <laughs> You're a Krakow. You're a Krakow. <laughs> Krakow. Mm. Krakow. That's Krak-cow. what you said, right? Yeah, Krak. Cow. Like the animal. So he was born in Krakow, Poland, and spent his entire life raised there. His father was an engineer for the army, and his mother a housewife and activist for the League of Women. Hmm. Sounds like a superhero league. I know. Both parents were from well-educated families and provided for their children good lives. He also had a sister, who was eight years younger. He seemed to have a normal upbringing and had no problems in school. Despite being well-liked, by his teachers, he was somewhat of a loner amongst his classmates due to shyness and isolated from the other students for having a strange personality. Mm. I can just picture him in like the corners of the room, just like looking at everyone. Yeah, you can always tell like, the oddballs, you know? Just like, I hate all of you because none of you like me. Yeah, you can tell. I'm like, we don't like you because you don't like us. It's just like this vicious cycle. He would have had many degrading nicknames from them, including Sex Maniac, for his habit of groping female classmates. The only friend he had was an older girl from a sports club, an art student, Danuta W., whom he would later refer to as his girlfriend, but unclear if the feeling was mutual. He was a member of the local rifle club and became adept and versatile in the use of firearms, as well as karate and knife throwing. At one point, he was ranked 10th in the entire country in the youth division of shooting. That's pretty cool. I guess. So he would quickly become a favorite student, and his coach would assign him the role of deputy for economic affairs at the club. This allowed Carol to be responsible for the keys to the weapons and ammunition storage. He would later confide to a journalist, I could slay the whole of Krakow. He would also be invited to his coach's home, trusting him to be a good role model to his son. Mm. However, he did not realize that Carol was already beginning a list of potential victims, and his son would be on that list. What the fuck? Mm. It is not known if Carol spared him or if he would be caught before being able to carry out his plan. Unknowingly, the coach would remain in close contact with Carol. As a student, Carol had dreams of being a commando at an officer candidate school for the army. However, when he failed one of his subjects in college, he had a nervous breakdown when not accepted to the school. Later, he would be allowed to study at another college, the Technical Energy School for Communications, where his teachers found him to be a good student and from which he would eventually graduate. Hmm. During summer holidays, he and his family would travel to PCIM. <laughs> Pick him? I don't know. South of Krakow. Krakow. It was here where a bored young Carol would begin to visit a local butcher shop 
There, he would become increasingly fascinated by knives, dying animals, and blood. So strange. He found pleasure in watching the slaughter of livestock, and over time, became friends with the butchers, who would often allow him to help kill the calves. Mm. What began as a humorous dare to drink the still warm blood of pigs, he would develop a taste for blood, believing it to be sacred and empowering. He would use an air rifle that he kept at home to shoot meat that his mother would bring home for dinner, wanting to use the bullet against something other than an inanimate target. His fascination of watching the butchers would also lead to him beginning to torture and kill small animals himself, such Mm. as frogs. What did the frogs do? So random. Chickens Mm. and magpies. I have a question. What's a magpie? It's a bird. I had to Google it. <laughs> On fishing trips, he would stop his mother from killing the fish until after he had poked their eyes out. Fun fact, I just ate a fish eyeball recently. I saw that. Was it good? Uh, so the actual eyeball was really hard. Little and little I bit inside, right? Yeah, the white ball. Mm-hmm. So I, I asked like the waitress, I was like, do I eat this too? And she was like, yeah, you just press it down with your mouth. Did you like it? Uh, it reminded me of an oyster. Oh, interesting. Everything about it was with a pearl. Just like an oyster with a pearl. <laughs> I'm never going to do it again. So, we were talking about him poking out fish eyeballs mm. while they were alive. That's what the tangent was. As Carol grew older and more daring, he would begin torturing the family cats and his sister when his parents were away. What a fucking shit. He had been jealous of his younger sibling since she was born, believing that his parents loved her more. Mm. He would regularly beat her with anything from a hand strap to a belt and even coat hangers. The fuck? Once he almost poked her eye out, and when she cried, he would lock her in her room. He also began collecting knives for which his parents would give him money for, believing that he was simply developing an outdoorsy hobby rather than a sick obsession. Mm. He would immerse himself in studying anatomy books, imagining the kind of wounds that could be inflicted on people, and developed an extensive knowledge of toxicology and forensics medicine. He also had a fascination of the history of concentration camps dreaming of mass murder in gas chambers, roundups, and the mutilation of quartering people, particularly women. When he visited Auschwitz as a boy, he was amazed by the organization and concept of it, professing a desire to have been born earlier so that he could have commanded one. Huh. You know, the Polish weren't safe during the Nazi regime. I don't know what kind of fantasy he lived in. Mm. Well, he wasn't a Jew. He just happened to live in Poland, right? Yeah. But still, they, like, they, like, took over Warsaw. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if you weren't a Jew, you didn't have anything to worry about. Yeah. It was still disruptive to communities. On September 21st, 1964, at the age of 17, Carol would make his first violent attack. He packed two knives with him and would sit and wait in a church for an elderly parishioner to make his first victim. But after a period of time, he got up and left, not finding a faithful fit for his first sacrifice. He then went to a second church and once again waited a long time. It was only as he was leaving, frustrated that no one showed up, that Helen Valgen, 48, entered. When she knelt down to pray, he pulled out a bayonet concealed in his jacket and drove the knife into her back. From behind. He aimed for her heart, intending for the blow to be fatal. Afterwards, he would run out of the church and a, at a safe distance away, lick the blood off the blade. Mm. However, the blow was not serious and she would survive the attack. I'm glad she survived the attack. Mm. So they, they know, said that she had this thick fur coat on. And the, I don't know if this is the ex- The extra skin helps mm-hmm. her survive. It was so shallow, and so she didn't even realize that she had been stabbed until later she realized that she had a lot of blood coming out of her. 
It was serious, but it wasn't. Serious. I mean, it's serious yeah. because someone like just randomly attacked her. Right, but she, it wasn't to the point where she recognized right. that she had gotten stabbed, and it wasn't until later. You know, as I read this, I was thinking like, you go to church because you want to be a good person. The last thing you expect mm -hmm. is for some psycho to be waiting in the pews. Pews. I knew that. I was getting there. <laughs> To slay, like stab you. Yeah, and that's yeah. just crazy to me. It's supposed to be a sanctuary. Yeah. Yeah. The devil is not supposed to let that. I mean, God is not supposed to let the devil in the door. <laughs> uh, a few days later, on September twenty third, he would spot Francisca Lewandowska. That is a very Polish name. Francisca Lewandowska, seventy eight, leaving a tram. He would follow her to her apartment. And then stab her, also in the back, as she went up the stairs to her home. She would stumble and fall down the stairs, and Carol, certain that the attack was fatal this time, quickly fled the scene. This assault, however, was also an unsuccessful murder attempt, although it left the elderly woman paralyzed with a broken spine. What a piece of shit. Both victims would report being attacked by a young male. Helen Velgen would be able to recall an additional detail that her attacker had a red shield stitched on his jacket, indicating that he was a high school student. Six days later, on September 29th, he would succeed in his first murder, stabbing Maria Plichta, 86 from behind as she walked down a deserted street near a church. When found by a nun, she would whisper to her that her attacker was a young man before losing consciousness. Curious about the outcome of his attack, Carol would go to the hospital and inquire about her condition. She would die the next day. For 17 months, the violent attacks seemed to cease, but that didn't mean Carol was done. In between his violent attacks, Carol would also attempt to poison random people. He bought arsenic and would frequent the pri the Prizzy Blaniak, Prizzy Blaniak, a <laughs> local bar. One day, he would sit at a table and order beer and jelly. What the fuck? Who orders beer and jelly? <laughs> I don't understand. Is this a Polish thing? Hey Google, beer and jelly. Hey Alexa, what is beer and jelly in Poland? Here's something I found on the web. According to BeefDanceSausages.com, traditional jazz is a meat jelly made from pork legs that agree very well with vodka or beer. Pork jelly. And there you go. Yeah. Well, now I know what the jelly is. I was picturing a fruit jelly. It's a pork jelly. Oh, that's it's kind the, of gross. It's the pork belly jelly. <laughs> There, he would swipe a <laughs> bottle of vinegar from the counter when no one was looking, <laughs> lace it with arsenic, and put it back in hopes that someone would use it later. Asshole. Cut. Is it safe to dine in public? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Can you imagine? You're just like, you're like I like some malt vinegar on my I like, thighs. like, literally, like, you're like, oh, I guess it was food poisoning. No, someone put arsenic in the fucking Jesus. vinegar. This guy is giving me anxiety. He would also leave out bottles of beer and soda in popular places, poisoned as well, in hopes that someone would drink it. But these, no one ever did. Yeah, who's going to drink an open bottle? How do they know a bum never drank it? How do they know? That's true, a bum wouldn't be reported, would it? No. No. I mean, bums go into the garbage and drink shit. Yeah. Here in L.A. They're not prioritized they're in the news. No, they're not. Once he poured a large quantity of arsenic, easily enough to kill anyone who ingested it, into a classmate's drink, but the boy noted a funny smell and didn't drink it. Similarly, he tempted a girl he fancied at school with a poisoned bottle of beer. But she declined. Because that female intuition, y'all! Carol also became fascinated by fire and would plot and attempt several acts of arson. He would attempt to set a house alight. But when he returned to see how much damage he had done, he was disappointed to see that it never caught and there was not even smoke. Okay, I just have to say, like, he's the worst 
like guy at trying to wreak havoc. Like he's mm-hmm. so He's actually not good at it. Bad at it. <laughs> and I hope your spirit can hear me dissing you because you suck. I can't imagine you're still alive. Carol Crack Hauer. He would attempt again in the basement of another house. This time lighting rags and loose papers, but still to no effect. The closest he got to properly to property <laughs> I got this. Uh, the closest he got to property destruction was setting fire to a wooden toilet at a shooting range. But a caretaker managed to extinguish it before any significant damage was done. There used to be wooden toilets. Isn't wood bad for, like, with water? Water, doesn't it, like, rot wood if it's, like, t- touching too often? Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was lacquer. Yeah, you have to have a finish on it. I was just thinking, like, boats are made of wood. And they <laughs> float in the water <laughs> for months and then retract that observation. Uh, frustrated by the lack of victims from his poisoning and arsenic, arson attempts, he returned to his previous M.O. Knives. Should we get more alcohol? Seriously, vodka? I can drink, like... So I killed that bottle that one night. <laughs> Are you going to the party? You're going to the um, weekend uh-huh. cabin thing? Yeah. yeah, when we texted about it. She almost cut a gopher today. Wow, that's like the same size as you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, do you miss me? Do you miss your auntie? Yeah, clean my earwax. <laughs> All right, we got to get back to the story. I Jackie and I just clearly <laughs> really miss each other. We haven't seen each other in a while, so. <laughs> Too much <laughs> Patreon content. So, back to the story. Mm. On February 13th, 1966, the bodies would start up again. Lezek, Kalik, and an 11-year-old boy was pulling his sled to attend a local toboggan contest when he was grabbed by Carol and fatally stabbed an excessive 11 times. Yeah, that's a lot for an 11-year-old boy. Shockingly, no one noticed. When the newspaper published a photograph of the young boy, he was so excited that he planned to completely wallpaper his room with pictures of the victim. He didn't, only to maintain the thrilling facade of being an unremarkable boy, as his father would remark at the dinner table. Only a bastard could commit such heinous acts. Quinn is uh, having at it. Quinn just likes all the flavors on my hand because I ate food with my hand. <laughs> I'm just gonna go give you kisses. His breath is super bad today, so don't let him kiss you. It's really bad. No, Dexter, stop. On April 14th, two months later, an eight-year-old girl named Malgerzata would turn up dead on the street downstairs from her home when she went to collect letters from her mailbox. Carol was sitting on some steps outside the apartment complex, waiting for his next victim when he spotted Malgerzata. She would be grabbed and stabbed eight times to the stomach, chest, and back. After Carol fled the scene, the girl would manage to return to her home and rush to the hospital where the doctors managed to actually save her life. After the attack, he went to the police station to extend his gun license and then went to eat dinner. Four days later, upon hearing that the girl survived, he would return to the home and speak to her mother. From this, he would glean the girl's name and that she only remembered that her attacker was wearing a white scarf. He's a psycho. Yeah. After so many attacks, the police were under enormous pressure to find the murderer. They increased the number of police patrols and extended their investigation, releasing press releases and urging witnesses to come forward. Investigators would anal- uh, who analyzed the attacks would discover some commonalities and deduce that the culprit always acted alone, chose victims weaker than himself, and would attack suddenly, inflicting wounds to the abdomen and upper back. They did not suspect there to be any sign of robbery, leading them to believe that the motive was based purely on sadism. Based on these findings and testimony from the victims, they began to pay specific attention to young men showing aberrant behavior. Mm. A taxi driver once reported a suspicious young man and accurately described Carol, but the authorities decided that the witness was not credible. 
Because what? He drove taxis? Lame. The citizens of Krakow were terrified of this vampire killer. So wh 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 why did they think he was a vampire killer? I mean, we know that he was drinking the blood off a knife, but mm -hmm. did they know that? I guess in hindsight, maybe it wasn't the vampire killer. Maybe it was just the crazy guy. Got it. The yeah. killer. But in uh, hindsight, knowing that he licked the blood off of the yeah, blade every time vampire. he killed someone and yeah. was drinking like the yeah, blood. He's stuff. obsessed with blood. Yeah. And some would go out with boards and pot lids tucked under their clothes to protect themselves from possible attacks. Carol would confess about his lust for blood and pleasure inflicting wounds to his friend and classmate, Danuta, who initially did not take him seriously. Mm. Once he even put a knife to her throat, wanting to see the insane fear in her eyes. But her reaction was to laugh and say that if he killed her, he would undoubtedly be the main suspect. This reaction probably saved her life. When he once again revealed a desire to kill her by revealing shards of glass in his pocket, which he planned to cut her with and planned to make it look like a suicide. She did grow somewhat concerned. She convinced him to go to a doctor who sent him home with vitamins. Vitamins. Okay, why is there a picture of this? I don't know, but it was on the interwebs, and I thought it was a good picture. Oh, it's a great picture, but like... But like clearly they how thought is, they were like playing, How right? is there a photo of him pretending to stab her, you know? Yeah. It's like... Too much. I think this is just like them joking around. Crazy. Can you imagine, like, if one of your friends no. was like, "I'm gonna kill you," my You'd boyfriend. Like, okay. Can you imagine if Kai was like, wow. "I'm gonna murder you"? Yeah, you would laugh. You'd be like, "Okay, great." You'd be like the main suspect, obviously. Yeah, she didn't realize how close she was to actually have being killed. Did he send him home with vitamins? Like a vitamin C deficiency. What, scurvy's gonna cause craziness? I got your mouth. <laughs> I got your mouth. Give me your mouth. I got your mouth. <laughs> She's like, why would you shoot that to me? <laughs> However, when he confided to her and boasted of his attack of eight year old Malgorzada in detail, Danuta would begin to realize that this was more than just a product of a sick imagination. And she raised suspicion to the authorities. Hmm. He was then arrested on June 1st, 1966, only one day after his graduation examination. The authorities had enough evidence to prove him to be a murderer, but deliberately waited for him to sit for his final exams in order to prove that he was sane. Smart. Hmm. And unable to plead insanity during his trial. So smart. Wow. Good job. When they approached his apartment, they were initially taken aback by the sympathetic, kind, and polite boy that greeted them. Carol would initially deny everything, but when asked about one of the victims, he couldn't help but proudly talk about his achievements. Upon his arrest, his coach from the shooting club would write a letter to the Ministry of Justice in Carol's defense, protesting the arrest of his favorite pupil, convinced it was a mistake. It couldn't be my Carol. Hmm. My change was. On June 3rd, two days after his arrest, he would have his first formal interrogation, and on the 6th, he would be identified by Helena Velgen, his first victim, who he had stabbed in the church two years prior. He would threaten her. Your memory is good. Come here so I can finish you off. Yeesh. Yeah, that's right, Dex. <laughs> 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 Yeah, show us that belly. Once identified, he openly confessed to his crimes and detailed his attacks and other murder attempts. He would also reveal sick fantasies about plans that he had not yet to manage to carry out, which were increasingly more graphic and disturbing. In one, he wanted to find a girl to rape, then skin her, and then set her on fire. Okay. In another, he said he wanted to gouge out a girl's eyes and put explosives in her vagina. Oh my God. What the fuck? Some of the plans were so extreme that the court would have them withheld from trial. 
A search of his home would find 16 knives and an assortment of other weapons. Everything that serves for human destruction, he described. His former coach, who once had such hopes and admiration of Carl, would write a second letter. Excuse you. Come here. Was that his head? Yep. Aww. He has his head all the time. He's fine. <laughs> the head massage. It's like a head job. Ooh. Gross. Gross. But he was like the same motion, you know? <laughs> After his confession, his former coach, who once had high hopes and admiration of Carol, would write a second letter, this time addressed to his former student in prison, full of indignation and regret. He would ask him to return his sportsman badge as he was unworthy of the title of athlete. Ultimately, he would be charged with two murders, four attempts of murder by knife, six attempts by arsenic poisoning, and four counts of arson. Mm -hmm. When taken to crime scenes to recant the events, he would smile for the camera and visibly cheer up as he reenacted his attacks for the authorities, seemingly unaware of the gravity of his crimes. Okay, so that must be what those photos are. Mm. Him posing. Because mm -hmm. look, he's pretending to stab oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. his girl. I mean, that looks like his girlfriend again. Why would she volunteer to be a part of it? Or maybe she was just... Um, or maybe this is an actor, not his actual... Maybe that's not Dan Ota. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's probably mm -hmm. not her. It's right. just like someone posing Some sort of as, hired as the witness. Yeah, actor. Numerous psychological observations and, and examinations by expert witnesses would discover that Carol had strange behaviors and inclinations since early childhood. One team of forensic S experts would find Carol to be a psychopath without higher emotionality and could not understand or adapt to social norms. In turn, psychiatrists believed that he was fully aware of the effects of his actions and in control of them. However, the courts would agree with the psychiatrist and conclude that he was completely sane and should receive the full consequences of his actions at trial. I agree. When asked during one interview whether he knew that murder was an evil crime, Carol would answer that he believed morals to be subjective to what brings an individual satisfaction and sense of a fulfilled duty. Mm. I totally agree that that is how those crazy people think. Mm -hmm. Like... Because some people are always like, like oh my you god. Agree? <laughs> no, like, because I always, like, like, people always ask, like, how could someone do something like that? And in their brain, they think In their right. brain, they're like, oh no, I'm just doing what makes me really happy. It's just like, how oh, yeah. you do what makes you happy. And it's like, well, according to society, you're not allowed to do this. Yeah. So fuck you. Yeah. It's like 99% versus one. One percent agree with you. Yeah. 99% of us are all on the same page. You don't fucking kill people. You do you within reason. Right. And if you break, <laughs> and if you don't follow our, you know, idealisms, then we're going to put you in jail. Mm. And that's why people are in jail. For the most part. Hey. Hey, guys. Stop. stop. They missed each other so much. You and I missed each other because we haven't seen each other in a while. They missed each other. When you said Quinn can't wait to see Dexter, I was like... You mean Jackie can't wait to see Vita. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I know. Miss her. You. She just is like, I'm gonna hide behind my dog as if my dog can oh. communicate to me that she misses another dog. <laughs> I did miss you. <laughs> he further defined evil men as drunkards and those who had sex with prostitutes. Thus he considered himself just a murderer. Not an evil. But just not an evil person. <laughs> yeah. He claimed that he was purposed to remove undesirable people as a service to society. He said suffering is beauty and inflicting pain and suffering on someone is a work of art. Not everyone can do it. You know, it, I just think of like the, the one psychopath that I dated and it did feel like relentless torture. It was just like, yeah. do you enjoy making me feel yeah so shitty because it's Constantly. just it's just like you won't stop and it seems to be the only way you want to communicate and it's the only thing you're interested in mm. and it's just like it won't end mm. and it just and i always thought it was like okay i just have to get away from this person because this is just how they function mm. and i can't change them 
because this is how it makes sense for them to function. Yeah, their thought process is totally different. Right. Than ours. Like no matter how much you try to reason with a person like that, yeah, they're gonna be like, oh, but you should be suffering though. I'm gonna have a little bit more tequila and then I'm done. <laughs> I didn't pour a full like four. Like I poured that much last time. So this is technically the second half of my second half. All in all, the case would amass more than 8,000 pages of evidence. It's a lot of evidence. His trial would begin on May 3rd, 1967, almost a year after his arrest. And Carol would plead guilty to all charges. With pride, I'm sure. Yeah. He appeared to be relaxed and cheerful and needed to be reminded by the judge to take the proceedings seriously several times. The surviving victims would all present in court to say their piece, screaming at him and calling him a beast. He would not display any sign of remorse. Because he's a fucking animal. Mm -hmm. The verdict was read on July 14th. It took that long? Jesus, why did it take that long? May 3rd to July 14th? And Carol would only be found guilty of the murder of 11-year-old boy, Lezek Kalik. However, this was enough to sentence him to death. After this, an appeal was filed, and his sentence would be reduced to life imprisonment. However, a higher court would reinstate the original sentence. His reaction would be unfazed, saying the murder thrilled him and gave spark to his heavy, dull, and colorless life. The pleasure I felt when the knife was cleaving the meat. It's Ugh. impossible to describe the feeling. The experience is worth the gallows. On May 16th, 1968, so a year after his trial started, mm -hmm. Carol Cott's death sentence was carried out by a hanging in the city of My Slowis. My Slowis. My Slowis. His final words. Soon, where I'm going, I'll meet with my victims. And we can speak. Here on Earth, I have no one to talk to. He was only 21 years old. I was anticipating him saying, like, I will meet with my victims again and kill them again. <laughs> I'm like, damn, that's dark as shit. An alleged autopsy would curiously reveal a large brain tumor. However, this is disputed as autopsies were not routinely carried out in convicts after punishment of death. There are no official documents confirming this found. It is debated that if such a tumor was found, if it would have been the cause of his behavior. Mm. Today, Carol Cott is no longer feared, but somewhat of a minor grotesque celebrity. There are macabre Krakow, Krakow, Krakow free walking tours that advertise the legend, and you can enjoy arsenic-free beer at the Katkorola pub. What the fuck? Why are they celebrating him? The mascot of the club, a grinning cartoon, cat nestled up to Edgar Allan Poe, after Carol, whose last name Cot means cat in Polish. Tourism is such a weird... You know, like, there's ghost tours anywhere you go. New Orleans, there's, you know... Yeah. Haunted ghost tours, like Crazy Killer, the Winchester House. Yeah, but that's about the people that died, not about the murderer. You're not, like, celebrating the murder. No, you are. I mean, if you go to Europe, you can do, like, the whole Jack the Ripper tours. Okay, fine. Never mind. You know I don't what I mean? know. Like, I don't know anything. So, Ugh. what I have to say is, well, fuck that guy. Yeah. Uh, what do I have to say? <laughs> tequila is good. I like tequila more than this story. So, Cat Carol. What was his name? Carol Cat. Cat. Carol, Carol Kotz. I'm learning German. Katze. His cat. Katze? Katze. K-A-T-Z-E. K-A-T-Z-E. Dein Katze is rude. <laughs> Your cat is rude. Rude cat? I don't know how to say rude in German, but I got my point across. <laughs> okay, so what do we want to talk about with this case? I don't know. I don't either. I just thought it was an interesting case once I started going into it. He's so young to be so bloodthirsty. I mean, uh, here are the things that I find interesting. Mm. That the Polish government or police, whatever, the officials, they actually got 8,000 
pages of evidence. Mm. That is great. I mean, they didn't... They... They did their research. I mean, I find it fascinating that they did photo shoots of what he did. They asked him to pose in the mm. position of what he did. I mean, it's, it's very fascinating to me. I've never heard mm-hmm. or seen. Excuse me, I was speaking. I never heard or seen that before. You know, stories like this mm-hmm. of like such a monster, right? And I'm mm-hmm. trying to picture them in real life. And I'm trying to think mm-hmm. like, have I ever met someone like this? Mm-hmm. You know, I no idea if I've met someone like this but it's pure evil I agree with the prosecution where they're just like you're an evil man he's like no I was doing what I thought was right and it's like no because your purpose in life is to kill and make others suffer well that's an interesting point because like I feel like that's a consistent perspective that a lot of serial killers have they think what they're doing is not wrong I even know. though society says murder is bad yeah they feel it's their duty to rid themselves of bad people or terrible women like right when they like target prostitutes or something a lot of them have that justification that they're getting rid of like sinners right and i find you know? it interesting that he said that and it's like he's mm-hmm. targeting like young children and churchgoers and, and it's like yeah. What is yeah. the thought process yeah. here? Like none of it made any sense to me. Yeah. His choice of victims was very interesting to me. He was completely random, right? Like in the beginning he was targeting elderly, but probably but he's only claiming because that it was organized. Like that there was a theory behind it. I was like, what was the Yeah, theory? yeah. I think initially yeah, so that is strange that he would say that he's ridding the world of unsavories, but it was completely random. Yeah, he was just waiting, waiting for random victims, like with the churchgoer, Halim. Hey, he... come here. Sorry, they're making a lot of noise. Come here. Like, yeah. Shh, shh, shh. You know, but the sound, you know. Okay, go for it. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, he targeted the elderly people at first, probably because he was too scared and shy of being overpowered. Oh. But then after he took that break trying to like poison people and everything else, he came back and he only murdered children. Once again, only victims. That yeah, the he prosecution knew. identified, yeah, yeah, that he could overpower. But that's so cowardice. I mean, what's the difference between this guy and our common day like uh, gunman that goes to schools, right? Like, what is the difference? Mm. Because Today, I think it would be a lot harder to get away with just stabbing someone. Everyone has a camera on them. Everyone has a camera. Yeah. There's CCTV everywhere. So if you go into your local church and you stab someone, you're on camera. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they record everything in there. Yeah. Um, So today, it's like these psychos that believe they're going to cleanse the earth of, of whatever, they do mass shootings. And... The question really is, when will true crime be put out of business? You know? Mm. Like, when will people stop yeah, doing never. this shit? No, they won't. Never, never. So, like, I was going to say, this guy killed a handful of people over the course of years. Yeah. And that's because the weapons that he had at his disposal were knives. And arsenic. And arsenic. But, like, nobody actually like, fell into the arsenic trap. No, he did. No, but nobody died from it. Oh. He attempted, but nobody actually, like, imbibed. So, that we know of and can prove. I, I you know, I do wonder, like, if there were victims in the interim. That, between, the, like, the but poisoning. He, I mean, he stuff. said he bragged. I'm having a little bit more. <laughs> he said he bragged about everything. So... But we don't know if someone actually drank the Kool-Aid, you know? Oh, yeah, that's what you mean. Yeah. Arsenic poisoning. We don't know. Like, the public, like, arsenic. Because mm-hmm. he just left, like, random bottles in random places. Well, that's how you get roofied. Yeah. Have you ever had a roofie? No. I've been roofied like twice. That sucks. At least. I feel like I look like a girl that would have been roofied, but no one ever roofied me. I just slept with people voluntarily, you know? 
So this will be another outtake for Patreon. Because, <laughs> like, no one deserves to know this about us unless they pay. <laughs> <laughs> Present day, a gunman can easily kill that many, if not more, in one setting. Yes. It's, it really, like, escalates the mm-hmm. the value, the, the, the quantity. Yeah, Not yeah, the yeah, yeah. Quantity. Because a knife, like, I mean, that's kind of one-on-one, right? Yeah. He, he, but like, they discussed how he had practiced shooting. They did. But he didn't he use a gun to kill people. to use. Which is he also was, an interesting He was more choice. into the feel of yeah, killing. It's very you know? personal. Yeah. A lot more intimate. Yeah. Kind that of like a dog when they use their mouth to kill. Intimate. Mm. Quinn almost had a gopher today. Did I tell you that? Little killer. She totally is a Harley Quinn. Yeah. Mm. They can see each other. She doesn't mind his bad breath. That's a nice. That's good for you, Dex, because your bad breath is bad. I'm becoming an expert dog hair cutter because I can't afford it. He's got that scruffy trim. Yes. Cuteness. But I still... Are you going to hump him? Don't. She's going to hump his face. She's like, get that puss. Okay, anyways. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I don't know. I mean, this was just like an upsetting case in general. I'm fascinated by how much facts, data, photography, mm-hmm. you know, like that. Yeah. There's a lot of good evidence. Yeah. Usually, mm-hmm. it's more like mm-hmm. big question mark, like what yeah. happened? I think it's also interesting that he came from a good family. Right, and that goes back to that whole thing from season one where we would discuss mm-hmm. uh, bad seed. Nature or, versus nurture. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and... Because he's not coming from a place of trauma. He's just the bad no. seed. No, <laughs> and there's people that go through a lot of trauma that are like the sweetest people on earth. So trauma doesn't make you a monster. No. It just maybe exacerbates pre-existing behaviors. Yeah. I mean, this guy seeked out a butcher shop right. on a vacation. Right. So there was clearly something bizarre. Yeah. I mean, there's there's people we've all met in passing where we're just like, ugh, their vibe was weird. They're so strange. Yeah, and you're just like, I just don't want to talk to that person. Yeah. They're just so, they give me the creeps. Yeah. So bizarre. And they're like the ones that like hate women or hate socializing because they're like, everyone thinks I'm weird. And it's like, well... Like you, you are. are. <laughs> so <laughs> fucking weird. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Mm. Jeremy G. Jeremy G. Mm-hmm. For bringing this to our attention. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening. If you're on the podcast, uh, iTunes or Spotify or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. (laughs) Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We also have a Patreon if you didn't know about that. And we have all the links below of all of our socials. Please like this video and watch until the end. Three, two, one. Good night. (laughs) What's that? Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.